For those of you used to the pressures of rush hour traffic, this journey into work will seem like heaven. These narrow lanes are a million miles away from the chaos of the city. This is a world where time seems slower. It's a place where traditional craftsmen ply their trades, where quality of life and way of life go hand in hand. This is Easterbrook in Devon. I think either you, you enjoy what you're doing or you make money at doing what you don't enjoy doing. And I, I don't think anyone in their right mind would do a job for, you know, it's less money than the people <laughs> that you're employing and not enjoy it. It would be crazy. So just by the fact that we're doing it must, must mean that we've got a passion for it. It's a lovely way to make a living. It's, uh, seeing these things as they're yeah. finished now. I mean, it still astonishes us, you know, because you're, you're working on small details, you don't realise what you're making until right at the end, then suddenly a sort of, Poom, and you look at this thing, I mean, did we make that? How did that happen? <laughs> you know, it's just, it as well. You know, and then you play it and it's great. And it's, yeah, it doesn't seem quite possible somehow, but... But of course we have. Andy and Simon are the owners and makers of Brook Guitars. Ten years ago, Andy was a garage mechanic and Simon a builder. It was work that didn't inspire and led them to crave a job where they could use their varied skills to produce objects which people would desire rather than just require. They found it making acoustic guitars. Building houses and fixing cars may not appear to be the type of occupations that would give you a good grounding in Luthery, but guitar making requires a unique blend of art, craft and engineering ability. It also requires a good teacher. Simon and Andy were fortunate to have Master Luther Andy Manson as their tutor. enough to run across Andy Manson, yeah. who was willing to share his skills. We started with a running business. It's not like we started up from scratch. We started, started up really on Andy's, um, on Andy's back. I think it'd have been very difficult. I think if we, we'd have met and said, what we're gonna do is make acoustic guitars and, uh, and sell them, well, I think we'd be building houses and mm. fixing cars right now. So, you know, Andy taught us, you know, not only the how to make a guitar, but, you know, so much else about how you go about selling the things and the confidence, you know, that you can make a guitar that is you know, a world-class instrument that people will buy. Just down the road from Andy and Simon is the workshop of a legend. A man who, within his field, has gained worldwide respect. Andy Manson is a doyen among luthiers. His custom-made guitars have been played by some of the world's top musicians. Sting, Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones are among those who own a Manson. Guitar making is a solitary profession, and Andy has always preferred to work alone. But in 1990, he was persuaded to expand his business. One of my customers came along and uh, decided to throw some money my way and uh, expand the business. 
and uh, I was a bit nervous of the whole thing, to be honest, to, to begin with. But he was very persuasive and encouraging, and I thought, oh, well, let's give it a go. And so we set up the, the thing at Easterbrook and took on uh, Simon and Andy, who you've met, and uh, just set about getting to grips with the whole thing and how, how we could produce lots of guitars as opposed to one at a time, which is what I've been used to. It was a good, a good mix to get together, because Andy's very much an engineer kind of person. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Simon is, is uh, very artistic and a lot of musical background and, and lots of experience with guitars and playing them and so on. And a craftsman also. Um, I think it's a really good mix. I suppose it was about three years we were together down there. And then I found myself being rather frustrated by my role at that point because the guys were competent enough to do the work. I seemed to be doing a lot of management work and, and, and feeling uncomfortable with that whole position, really. So I left them to it and went back to working on my own. I'd come to realise that when you work for a long time acquiring specific skills you have something which is not actually entirely yours there's a certain responsibility aspect to it there feels a need to to pass it on somehow to hand it over otherwise you feel kind of trapped with this thing and if, if you're going to die uh, that's it St there's something that's stopped which needn't have actually stopped <laughs> Sharing knowledge ensures that traditional trades such as luthery will prosper. But having the skills is one thing, having the confidence to make a living out of them is another. I think most people who make things with their hands are, are never happy with them. If you talk to 90% of people who, who do you know, craft type of work, will all be unhappy about the, what they're producing in one way or another and and wouldn't feel able to sell it but I, you know, Andy gave us that confidence that we you know we knew that we were making a, a brilliant product and that people would buy it since purchasing the Easterbrook operation Simon and Andy have had to learn the fundamentals of running their own business as the company has prospered they've needed to expand they now employ two more people. In the world of English guitar making, this is expansion on a massive scale. But the managerial responsibilities that are part and parcel of such empires have been difficult for them to accept. something that's been forced upon us, really, in the way that uh, it's not what we enjoy doing. And if we want to be making guitars, which is basically what we're about, we have to sell them. So that's it's, the only it's, reason. It's a necessary evil yeah. to allow us to do what we want to do, really. All I want to be doing is making guitars. I don't want to be faffing about on a computer doing the bookwork but it's something that has to be done because if, if the business doesn't survive, then we don't survive and we, we have to go back to doing horrible jobs. Go back to building, go back to... Have to get a job, wouldn't we? <laughs> Andy and Simon have developed a close working relationship. They have a mutual understanding which is particularly evident in their work. They assess the quality of each guitar at every stage of production. They may not have the procedures of large multinationals, but their quality levels are quite simply second to none. Well, it's just heavier around the heel and a bit more around the heel and just... Still looks a little bit green, doesn't it, with it? I don't know if it's just... I think when you've darkened it up... Spurned on by a love of what they're doing and a dread of returning to their previous professions, they're prepared to make whatever sacrifices they need to to ensure that the company stays afloat. You don't draw a lot of money out of the business, though. No. 
Why? No. <laughs> because we feel it's more important that it stays within the business so that Just the business can expand. Yeah. yeah. If, if we want to draw out something, um, it would be nice to think that we got the business into such a state that we could draw a decent wage out of it in the future. But at the moment, everything's going back into it, getting more wood. Their stock, a good selection of finished instruments is, I think, is really important. So that if someone visits the workshop, they've got something to see, not just, you know, half finished guitars. Although that, you know, has its own cost, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it'd be much nicer if that was converted into cash that was in the bank. The other thing is if we'd have been drawing out a proper living wage, we wouldn't be doing this now because we gone would under. have gone under, yeah. Because it's quite, quite a strange situation for, for two guys who run a company to be paying their staff more than they pay themselves. I'm not sure why, why you pay your staff more than you pay yourself. Because we can't get away with paying them any less. <laughs> It's the only way that we feel that the business can survive if... We wouldn't be going if, you know, we paid ourselves any more. And, you know, for us, the, you know, the important thing is Brooke Guitars, the, you know, the business, the company, it's not the, you know, the money that we've got to go down the pub with, it's not important. has a whole host of natural resources that Brook Guitars can utilise. When a suitable piece of wood is found, our dynamic duo will make a short excursion to the local sawyer to have it cut to the right thickness. One of the pleasures of the job is making use of natural materials, wherever they come from. As much local wood as we can use, the better. From walnuts that came down in the gales 10 years ago, to local sycamore, come from various places. I've got a guitar at home that I, the back and sides came from a walnut tree that fell down in the park next to where I live. The neck came from a bit of wood that I found in my dad's loft. Very good. And that's, you know, for me, that is just fabulous. It's, it's just nice. We made the guitar from Ian Anderson from a piece of timber from your neighbour's well, neighbor. garage. <laughs> There's a, an old bedpost, Victorian bedpost. It's a jar. It's, you know, I couldn't believe it. Incredibly hard. It's and an it was, excellent bit of wood. It was a great guitar. Choosing the right wood is an art in itself. Simon and Andy Sawyer is Bill Smith. He's a well-known beehive maker, and a man who knows a thing or two about wood. We know that walnut's always going to be nice. We know that Brazilian mahogany is always going to be nice, but some of the other stuff won't work because uh, of this interlocking grain and uh, the fact that it's going through uh, the saw and you don't know that there's going to be a problem until it's got part way through and then it's <laughs> off at an angle and... Uh, well, the blade will cut, won't it? That's the other yeah. dreadful thing that'll happen. It, it looks like it'll come through the top and bottom OK, but in the middle it's sort of, sort of moon shape. That imbuia we brought you up, that yes, was that dreadful, was, wasn't it? That was <laughs> hopeless. I don't want to see any of that ever again, <laughs> if I can avoid it. Well, I mean, it's good of you to try it for us. I mean, a lot of places would just, no way, take it away, but at least you gave it a go, and that's, the, you know, for us, that's important. You know, we did actually get some usable stuff out of it, so, you know, it wasn't a total disaster. Yeah, I mean, you'll find, actually, when it comes through again, it'll be all right, won't it? Because it'll, it'll straighten it up, but there's loads there, isn't there? The only thing is, you're not going to get another three out of it. No. Well, we're looking, I think, for evenness and beauty of the grain, and also we have to think about the sound that the wood's going to produce as well. Long-term stability is important. Stuff like oak here yeah. is not really a good tone wood. You, you know, it's just got no, no ring to it. 
whereas other pieces of wood, you pick it up and you can hear it's going to be a you know, good tone wood. to be cut into shape as soon as it gets back to the workshop. This will prevent it from warping during the drying process. It can take up to one year for all the wood components to dry out before assembly can begin. When you're dealing with such timescales, it's essential to have enough prepared stock just in case demand increases. This is not an industry that can work along the principles of just in time. We can't predict sales. All we can say is it will take us this, you know, X amount of time to build a guitar. It's going to cost us this in materials, this in overheads, and that's about as far as we can go with it. If, if we knew that we had 100 orders every year guaranteed, it would be easy to plan something, but we don't know how many orders we've got one month to the next. The most difficult problem, I would say, is marketing. Um, although, to, you know, to be fair, I... We've not really had to do any so far. We've, yeah, considering we're so bad at it, I think we've been done remarkably well. I think, in a way, the, the product does seem to sell itself, and I think there are a certain proportion of the public that will seek out an excellent handmade thing, whatever that may be. And it happens that we make guitars and people do seem to seek us out. So that's lucky for us. <laughs> When Simon and Andy have made sufficient stock, they'll get on the road to sell it to shops like Hank's in London's Denmark Street. The guitar market has tended to be dominated by big American brands like Gibson, Martin and Taylor. But the demand for English handmade guitars is on the up. The resurgence started probably about five to ten years ago on the British made guitars. I mean, there's a lot of fine British luthiers out there. Uh, the difference now is that the woods are getting very, very rare and there's a premium for each wood. I mean, there's Brazilian rosewood, which is a very, very difficult wood to get hold of. It's banned all over the world. Uh, you can't import Brazilian rosewood. The woods they use on handmade instruments are usually far superior to what they use on production line instruments. If you can go out and get a solid wood guitar now, do, because it's going to be worth an absolute fortune in, say, 10 or 15 years' time, because a lot of the stuff then will be compounds of wood, plywood guitars, all solid plywood guitars, even Martin themselves have tried a, a completely new concept guitar which doesn't actually involve any wood at all. It's a shame in a way that the production companies that don't concentrate as much on making the instruments as well as the, the handmade stuff can afford to you know, pay their staff so well and there's these little, little guys out in the sticks in their little thatched cottages and in their, their tiny little sheds producing instruments that will sell the world over, they can't afford to advertise them. It's all done by word of mouth. It's nice that, you know, when a customer leaves the shop, they've made that choice against all the other obstacles that have been put in their way. They've chosen the British handmade. I think it's a real credit to, to guitar luthiers. Keith and Eve. Hi there. Hi. Andy, are you? I'm Andy. Nice to meet you. Hi, Keith. Hi. Okay. Hi so, here we are. You yeah, found us are. okay? Oh, not too bad. Yeah, one little uh, mishap because I went into the little agricultural garage just down there. Oh, not too bad then. But, with uh, a Brook customer, no worries, yeah. Excellent. they usually come with their partners. They usually put up outside in either a Range Rover or something from out of town. <laughs> they don't often beeline the brook as the first instrument they're going to pick up. They will usually pick up the American Glamour Boys, like the Martins or the Gibsons. Um, then they'll carefully work through, they'll try the Loudons and they'll try a Manson, then they'll try the Brooks. 
And once they're, they're settled down, they'll get more into the instrument. And you can see there's a beaming smile on their face. They're kind of whispering sweet nothings to their partner, and the partner likes it. And if you can get the partner to like it, you're three quarters of the way there. I just like the colours and they're like silly. The colours. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my, what, what sort of guitar it is, as long as it's the right colour. Well, I wouldn't have a clue, really. As long as it's not red. Eh? You, you think the trade Well, you think you can't possibly go wrong. You've got so many choices. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep going there. OK, well, this is uh, another tabby, but... Um, Can you say it does? That's the same as the first one. Yeah. But it doesn't have the gold and hardware. Exactly. And it's in a slightly different wood. This is uh, lace wood, which is London plain. It's been cut on the quarter. I mean, to say we've done no marketing is probably not quite true. We often we try and send guitars in for review in the music press whenever we can. It's about four or five different magazines that regularly take guitars, so we generally go for about one a year in one or other of the magazines. We're mentioned in buyer's guides at the end of these magazines, which you don't actually have to pay for. I'm sure you know, mate. Which uh, review was it? Um, it seems at the Torridge and Tamar. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's it there, yeah. Well, I was sort of edging towards the old 12 string, but um, well, I did have a couple of young... It's one advantage, I think, of this, the location here is that people have got to be serious, reasonably serious anyway, before they come to visit you. Mm. You know, they don't get people sort of stumbling off the street. Oh, yeah. oh guitar makers, yeah, we'll just pop in here and have a look. <laughs> That'd be dreadful, we'd never get a thing done. So, you know, this is nice. You know, people who want to find this can find this. But people who are not really that fussed don't bother to come out. So that works really well, I think, doesn't it? The pleasures of people coming to them to buy are offset by the misery of cold coal selling. It's fun having people in ordering guitars because there's a lot of contact and, you know, you play guitar with whoever's coming, looking around the workshop. There's a lot of fun in that. So, I mean, that, I mean, that is part of the settings, but uh, as for going around the shops and uh, phoning around, it's... I think the main problem is... The, the main problem, as I feel about it, when you're doing what you might think of as, like, cold selling, which is often what you're doing when you're getting on the phone sending brochures, is that because you've put so much of yourself into the instrument, being told, no, I don't want one, it's like, you know, it's incredibly personal. <laughs> you know, you feel awful. And so you tend to avoid it because of the sort of fear of rejection or whatever. But it's just because it's so personal Whereas I think a salesman, well, he's not made the stuff, his job is to sell it. You know, if someone says, I don't want to buy that, I don't like it, well, he's not going to feel slighted by that because he didn't make it. And that's why we don't enjoy it. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. We were thinking to go to the States again. Were you? Yeah. That's a bit closer, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> 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 when well, the money was saved, you could buy a travel guitar. Easy. No, he's going to treat you. Yeah. 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 we were going on that cheap flying drive thing. Yeah. I know, but you've saved some money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. OK, thank you. Just start. You start them off, sir. It takes 200 man hours to make each guitar. Andy and Simon would expect to produce between 100 and 150 of them a year. This gives them a turnover of just £70,000. That's petty cash to some companies.
Saturate, saturate, saturate. <laughs> For Andy Manson, a misguided adventure into the world of publishing led to bankruptcy. But years living and working as a luthier has taught him how to survive and continue working against the financial odds. If you were to go to a professional business advisor, you know, he, again, he'd probably say to you just what I said, you know, forget the guitar making, you want to be in business, do something sensible. These days, business is largely focused on profit as opposed to product or service. So really, you've got to, I think you've got to run your business probably um, in spite of your work. You see what I mean? You've got to find, you've got to be determined about, about the work itself and somehow try and make the business fit that. You may never become a millionaire if you decide that guitar making's your trade, but you will have the pleasure of making instruments that will survive long after you're gone. Success here is not just judged in terms of profit. How would you judge success? It must be happiness, I would say. Happiness and contentment in your life. It would be nice to be earning a decent living from this, but uh, it's not obviously not the number one concern or we wouldn't be doing it now. I've seen plenty of miserable people who are very rich. It doesn't inspire me to earn a load of money one little bit. I don't.